Hi, everybody. I'm Al Rochelle, and thank you for joining us here on our webcast as we continue to talk about dysautonomia. And we are honored today, and I mean that really, to have Dr. Philip Lowe, who joins us, and we'll tell you why we're honored in just a second. Dr. Lowe, thank you for stopping by. I appreciate your being here. Tell me a little bit about your background, if you would, before we start talking about POTS, which is really cool. Go ahead. Yes, I graduated in medicine in Sydney, Australia, and came over to the Mayo Clinic in 1976. I got interested in the autonomic nervous system because of my research in Australia. I have subsequently become boarded in neurology and clinical neurophysiology. I founded the Autonomic Laboratory, the first of its kind, at the Mayo Clinic in 1983. At the time, I was interested in the autonomic disorders. It was called the Cinderella of Medicine because it was so neglected. Oh, gosh. At the time, there was only myself, Roger Bannister, the runner in England. Right, right, yeah. Um, and also uh, David Robertson at Vanderbilt. So we developed this field, and I'm pleased that the American Autonomic Society has become a large and active organization. Well, I can see why they call you the father of POTS because you were so involved early on. So for our audience, and most doctors already know, but tell me what is POTS? Define it for me. POTS is a condition or syndrome consisting of orthostatic intolerance, meaning that patients develop symptoms of lightheadedness and other symptoms when they stand up, coupled with an increase in, of heart rate by at least 30 beats per minute for adults. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what defines POTS. So well defined, but in the early years, how did you come up with, with that particular name for it? Was it because most of the patients you were seeing had those symptoms, or is it the other way around where you take the symptoms and then you fit them to the patient? The condition itself probably has been present for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. During the First and Second World Wars, there were soldiers who went by different names. Uh, they called it effort syndrome because they couldn't exert themselves. Uh, there was soldiers' heart because their hearts would beat too fast, etc. Mm -hmm. But the term um, postural uh, orthostatic tachycardia had been mentioned in a couple of publications uh, prior to my getting involved. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> there was a paper by Philip Cryer and also another one by Bob Holkey, uh, who were endocrinologists, diabetologists, who got interested in orthostatic intolerance in those conditions. And there was also someone else at the Cleveland Clinic, um, Dr. Fuad, who was interested in um, hypovolemia, low blood volume. Mm -hmm. But I got interested in it together with my fellow, Ron Shondoff, um, <clears throat> because we were dealing with autonomic neuropathies, especially autoimmune autonomic neuropathies, mm -hmm. where patients have damage to the autonomic nervous system. Some of them, uh, when they stood up, they had a heart rate as high as 160 beats per minute with orthostatic hypotension. So we reasoned that what if you had autonomic failure of lesser degree, sure. where they would still have the tachycardia, but without the orthostatic hypotension, those patients, uh, let's call them POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Mm -hmm. so, so we were interested in a subset of POTS with autonomic neuropathy. Now, I've heard some people and some of the doctors talk about using the word postural and then orthostatic uh, tachycardia. Sometimes you leave off the postural because it's like, well, maybe, that, maybe the other two words actually define it better. Right. I think the post most of us would prefer to leave the term postural so we don't always put in the term orthostatic. That's assumed. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So you assume that when you... Uh, posture means that you go from uh, lying or sitting to standing. 
Mm -hmm. So, uh, so since it began, since it was named, you've worked on it many, many years. What kind of advancements have been made in terms of treatment? There has been uh, about three or four major advances. Um, one of them is the demonstration that these patients have hypovolemia, meaning their blood volume is reduced. Mm -hmm. um, any normal person who has low blood volume would have orthostatic tachycardia. Someone who has a viral illness with vomiting and diarrhea, mm -hmm. if you c go to bed and you stand up, you get lightheaded, but you understand why. Sure. Um, these patients don't have an otherwise explainable mechanism, but their volumes are down. So that's one advance uh, that was found. A second advance is the recognition that patients are some patients are hyperadrenergic. The sympathetic nervous system is in overdrive. Right. That's a second group of patients. A third group is, a third finding is that deconditioning plays a major role in much of the symptomatology of parts. So define deconditioning, what does that mean? Deconditioning is a condition where you do, you're not on your feet for a significant period of time. One extreme example I can provide mm -hmm. are our excellent astronauts. These are fit persons who go into space um, and then they come back and they can't stand on their feet. They are severely orthostatic because they are deconditioned. They haven't been standing on oh, their okay, feet. Okay, okay, that makes sense. In fact, um, working with the NASA researchers, we were able to show that if you put a normal person to bed for more than two weeks and then they stand up, they have POTS. But oh then they gosh. Can, yeah. Something that simple. Now, uh, so as you're looking at this, everybody wants to know, okay, great, we now can recognize this, we now can recognize this, but you know what the next question is. What, can, what causes it? What causes it? Mm -hmm. I think that, well, deconditioning uh, affects, I think, the uh, balance of your autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, what <laughs> people have failed to realize is that chronic deconditioning has effects on your cardiovascular system. Yes. Um, Dr. Ben Levine uh, in Texas and the Mayo researchers were able to demonstrate that the heart uh, becomes altered in patients with POTS. Uh, ben Levine demonstrated what he called cardiac atrophy. The heart actually got smaller. Mm. And the Mayo researchers demonstrated that the stroke volume, the amount of blood that the heart pumps uh, with each uh, e effect, each effort, um, is reduced. So as a result, it's a very inefficient system. Mm -hmm. But just as importantly, the fourth important uh, advance, I think, is the demonstration that a program of exercise will reverse that, right. will reverse deconditioning and patients can lose much of their symptoms. That always sounds unusual to me because when you're not feeling like you can get up, when you're feeling sick to the stomach, you may be vomiting, you may be fainting, you have those things. So you're saying to yourself, exercise? I mean, I can hardly get out of bed and now you want me to exercise? That's an excellent point. And in fact, it's the biggest obstacle we have to patients who are extremely fatigued. The last thing they would like to think of is exercise. Yeah. They have the this is doctor, when I exercise or even take a few steps, I get wiped out and I have a very slow recovery cycle. Mm -hmm. And you're asking me to exercise. So that is a major challenge. Um, and the way we try to overcome that is to have them take baby steps. Sure. What we tell them to do is, I know what your goal is, I want you to be exercising at least four um, days a week for 30 minutes at 80% of maximum heart rate. I know you can't do that, but I'm going to work you up over three months oh, to gosh. do that. 
three so months it's, workup. It's baby yeah. steps. Well, that that's something that's doable. So uh, you know, w so where are we going in the future with this? What are you now keyed on? We know that exercise helps, but are we are we still trying to zero in on the mechanism that causes all of this? Is it the brain? Is it is it is it the, the spinal cord? I mean, what is it? It's certainly the brain is involved in at least a couple of ways. One is the hyperadrenergic state resides with the brain, so you need a drug that acts centrally. Uh, unfortunately, there's also a second phenomenon that's very active in someone with chronic POTS, and that is central sensitization, mm -hmm. where patients are much more aware of their symptoms than you and I. Yes. So that dominates their life. Right, they think about it all the time. Right, I explain to patients that the brain has a gating mechanism and the gate is too wide open, you need to close it down a little. And that is where training uh, is very important. Behavioral modification then comes in place Behavior like that. modification, wow. sometimes with the help of psychology, yeah. Do you think there ever will be a day, and of course, you say this in medicine, you can say this with any disease, when there'll be a pill that will correct all of this stuff, or is that ever going to happen? I think that it's not the best way to explain that to the patient, because I think probably not. Right. Um, I say this carefully because uh, POTS is a heterogeneous group of conditions. There are different types of POTS. For instance, the patient with neuropathic POTS, mm -hmm. you can uh, treat the patient to improve the autonomic damage. Okay. If someone had an autoimmune disease, for instance, an autoimmune autonomic neuropathy, you can try to use even a suppressive agents, etc. cetera. Um, but that is probably a small subset. Right. For most patients, I think it is important for them uh, to switch the emphasis from physician management to patient management so that if you give the patients the tools so that they understand their condition and if they know that there are certain tools that will improve um, aspects of their being. Yeah. They can do a lot better. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with this website and the Dysautonomia Project altogether. So uh, two last questions for you. Number one, you're talking to doctors right now. What key important thing would you tell the doctors in terms of that they might be dealing with this? First of all, make the correct diagnosis. Yeah. Secondly, try to define what is the major abnormality. Is there autonomic failure? Is there a hyperadrenergic state? Is there bad deconditioning? And focus on the management of those particular aspects. Mm -hmm. And now to patients, and you've talked about hope and being patient. So if you're talking to patients right now, what do you say? I say to the patient that based on what we know about the natural history of treated POTS, if you look at them a year after initiation of treatment, they are functionally improved. Uh, in fact, about 60% no longer fulfill criteria for POTS. But many of them still have some symptoms, so I emphasize to them that they should focus on function and not on symptoms. Mm -hmm. And they should also be empowered so that they can tackle the condition with the help of some physicians, but the patient takes charge. All right, all right. Doctor, thanks so much. It's an honor to work with you and to talk with you right now, and thank you so much, and, and I hope you keep up the good work. Pleasure.